Welcome to Burbank First United Methodist Church. I'm Sam, one of the pastors here, and I am just delighted to be in worship and community with all of you this morning. And by all of you, I do mean all of you, those of you watching on Facebook Live and on YouTube. As always, thank you for welcoming us into your homes. And for all of you here, let me just say that we have a a long and full day prepared for you. And I know that you're going to be excited. To begin with, we have some guests among us at the beginning of our service. Typically, we don't have our youth and our children here with us. But today we do because we just finished VBS. Today's kind of the the culmination of VBS. After all, it it is promotion season. So we're going to have a little video here at the beginning. And then at the end of service in Trevor Hall, we're going to have a a little recap uh, skit in Trevor Hall. So all are invited for that, especially if you want hamburgers and hot dogs. You have to stay for the skit too. All right. (laughs) So in a moment, we're going to show you the video. And then we're going to have a scripture reading. Uh, You all are going to be excused before the scripture reading for your respective places. But we also have another guest, guests that I want to introduce because uh, this individual is going to be part of my Sunday sermon. And every week in June, we're going to have a different guest uh, who will talk about helping children thrive. And today's guest... Thrive. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Dr. Greg Miller, who is principal of John Muir Elementary School, is here with John Muir Middle School. Sorry. I just had his son graduate from there two weeks ago. I should know better. Uh, He and his wife, Nikki, are here. If you don't mind just waving your hand. Thank you so much. Because many of you won't be here, I want to offer his, uh, a brief bio of Dr. Miller now before you are excused. At the start of his career as an educator, Dr. Miller taught in New Jersey, Mississippi, Russia, and South Africa. He then taught middle school math in LA, LAUSD for seven years before serving as an assistant principal for nine years. Dr. Miller came to Muir as principal 11 years ago, and he lives in Santa Clarita with his wife and two children. So thank you for making the drive in and being a part of our worship. And now, we're about to watch a very short video. Some of you may be in the video. Feel free to applause or cheer. And then immediately after that, you will be excused to your children and youth spaces. Here we go. Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew 18, verses 1 through 5. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child, whom he put among them, and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. The word of God for the people of God. Please join me in an opening prayer. Heavenly Father, as we turn our eyes to a very important uh, topic such as helping our children thrive, help us all to learn, be open, to have our ears open, our eyes open, and also to have our childhood innocence Uh, restored and valued and celebrated. God, may your protection, your anointing, and your love be showered upon all the children that are represented by the families, the friends, and your people here today. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Now let us continue in worship with an anthem from our chancel choir. So today we're starting a new series titled, Helping Children Thrive. And for the month of June, we are going to look at passages in scripture where Jesus mentions children or interacts with children. So from week to week, we're going to do our best to listen to what lesson Jesus is trying to impart upon us what value Jesus is trying to uphold by highlighting children, little kids. And today is kind of an introductory message. So as I begin, I want to make a couple of remarks. First, I'm really, really excited about this series. (laughs) And I know those of you who know me well, I say that before every series that I start, I do. But I truly believe that your excitement will match my excitement. That from week to week, you're going to look forward to helping children thrive. And one reason is because I won't be the only person speaking. We have the privilege of bringing in a local school principal from a local school to hear from their experience, their expertise, and how we together as a community can help children thrive. I think, I, just, I think that's really exciting. The other reason why, the other remark I want to make, and, and this is for this series in particular, it isn't just for parents or guardians with children. These are messages for everyone. If you're a single young adult without kids, if you're a senior thankful that you're done raising kids, <laughs> It's for you, because Jesus' message about children aren't just about children. They're about how we could be God's beloved community together. 
He doesn't highlight them to talk only about them, but to tell us how we could be our best selves as a community. There's a quote that I love, and this, there's different versions of it that points to our role as community members. And this one is attributed to Gandhi. You, you may know it. And it reads, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. And most vulnerable members refers to, yes, those disadvantaged and those with disabilities. Yes, those who are oppressed, but also our children. Because our children need our protection, our advocacy, our care, our guidance, and our love. If we help children thrive, we help our society at large thrive. And so we're all in this together. So I'm excited about this, and it's really a message for all of us. And as you know, in about 10, 15 minutes, we're going to bring up Dr. Miller. But before that, you have to deal with me, okay? So just indulge me for the next 10, 15 minutes, because we're going to enter into the passage that you just heard earlier. And it's a passage where the early disciples have been traveling with Jesus for years now. So for years, they have heard Jesus teach and preach. They have witnessed him heal and cast out demons. They have experienced firsthand Jesus' ministry. And there is one topic that Jesus talks about more than any other. There's one particular phrase that he mentions again and again. And in their question to Jesus, they mention that phrase. Let's take a closer look. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? There's that topic. There's that phrase highlighted. The kingdom of heaven, also stated as the kingdom of God interchangeably. I'll mention it as God's kingdom. Those who study the Bible for a living say that you can't fully understand the Bible unless you understand what Jesus means by the kingdom of heaven. So what is the kingdom of heaven? Well, it's helpful to understand what the kingdom of heaven is not. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, he's not referring to another location, another place above the blue skies. So he's not referring to some otherworldly location. He's also not referring to a specific time. The kingdom of heaven is not that point in time when we all pass from this life and continue into the next life. So the kingdom of heaven is not another location or another time, but rather in the scripture, Jesus comes proclaiming this kingdom, God's kingdom. He comes ushering in this kingdom. And what he's doing is he's announcing a new reality where God's presence and power is available. He's ushering in a new realm where God is in charge. The kingdom of heaven is life with God here and now. And I imagine you might have experienced moments of being in God's kingdom. Years ago, I went on a mission trip to Mozambique, Africa. At the time, Mozambique was one of the poorest countries in the world. And one of the things that me and my team did there were we, we were tasked to lead a VBS, kind of like the VBS that we just did this past week. Well, we did that in a small village in Mozambique. And there I was giving instructions for this VBS lesson plan. It was being translated from English into Portuguese, which is their native language. And you know, as an educator, or if you've ever been in a teaching position, you know when your lesson isn't going over well with the kids, right? You know when they're just not into what you're saying. Well, that's what was happening to me when I was trying to lead this VVS lesson plan. And at one point, it was crystal clear that they weren't into my lesson because one of the boys said something in Portuguese, and I couldn't understand him, so I asked my translator, what did he say? And, he said to, and the translator said to me, he said, we want to play football. And by football, it's not American football, it's soccer. And the other boys and girls start saying, we want to play football. Well, you want to play football? I looked at my team, 
All right. We played football. It was one of those Ted Lasso moments on the spur, right? (laughs) And so here's the thing. They didn't have a soccer ball. Instead, they got clumps of paper and rubbish, wrapped it around in a bunch of rubber bands, and that was a soccer ball. They didn't have a grass pitch. Instead, it was a dirt plain. They didn't have goalposts. Instead, one end of the goalpost was a tree. The other was my backpack. And there we started playing soccer together. And I mentioned that because there we were from different parts of the globe, from different upbringings, speaking different languages. But for that hour, we were learning from each other, engaging each other on God's behalf, being God's beloved community together. And that was a taste of God's kingdom, not because of the location I was in, but because of the relationship I was in, not because of that specific time period in my life, but because of the service that was committed to, to being served, being a servant of God. And as I look back, I have a couple. One, I really wish I scored a goal and I didn't score a goal that day. But that was a reminder of how the kingdom of God is something we can experience here and now. Here's a picture of my time there. Um, And I look back and say, wow, yeah, that was God's kingdom here and now. And in today's passage, the, the disciples, they talk about God's kingdom, but they don't fully understand because this is the question that they ask. They ask, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? So they seem to be asking Jesus, who has the highest rank in God's kingdom or who has merited the most achievement in God's kingdom? And I can imagine Jesus just saying, you know, as a teacher, when you're trying to convey a lesson to your students and they just didn't get it. And so what does Jesus do? He called upon a child whom he put among them and said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So here's what's happening here. See, on one end, the disciples are asking, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? On the other, Jesus replies, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is called a bookend or a literary device called a sandwich, that I like to say. There's bread on each end, but at the meat of the sandwich, Jesus is saying, here's the lesson. Unless you change and become like children, you won't enter God's kingdom. You won't experience the life God wants you to live. You have to become like children. So what is it about children that Jesus is highlighting here? What is it about becoming childlike that helps us experience life with God? Well, there are a lot of things that are precious about children. But but here's one that I think Jesus is highlighting. When children are born, they see you, they love you. Not because of what you've achieved, not because of your accomplishments, not because of your social status based on followers or likes. They just love you. But then as you know, life takes over, right? And we live in a world where our achievement is followed by affirmation. You get good grades, you get that degree, you get that promotion, great job, well done, congratulations. You work so hard to achieve that sometimes your work becomes your self-worth. And we get trapped in that cycle because you could always work more, you can always achieve more, you can always aspire to be great. But when that greatness and achievement and work is tied to your self-worth, that's when you don't experience the kind of life God wants you to live. That's when you don't enter God's kingdom. And that's what Jesus is trying to say to them. Here's another translation where he says, those who want to be humble, but the message translates it this way. He says, whoever becomes simple and elemental again, like this child, will rank high in God's kingdom. 
It's as if Jesus is saying, I know you've lived life. I know you've, there are a lot of voices telling you how to live, how to be great in life. But what I'm trying to tell you, God's kingdom is not about earning and achieving. It's about trusting and being and being loved by who you are and whose you are as God's beloved. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't aspire to be great. I'm not saying that ambition is bad. You should aspire to be great. You should be ambitious. But those things should not define your worth. One way that we help children thrive is by becoming childlike again. And knowing that our self-worth is not based on where you went to school, the job that you got, and the certificates on your wall, but by who you are as God's beloved child, your character. That's one of the emphases that Jesus makes in today's passage. And we'll look at more from week to week. But as I mentioned to you earlier... I won't be the only one speaking in this series. And at this time, I would like to invite up Dr. Greg Miller. And I have some questions for him so that we can further learn in our communal effort in helping children thrive. And as he wakes his, makes his way up and has a seat, he can take this mic. I have a couple of questions for you. Please make yourself comfortable. Just show by way of applause. I'm curious. I'm about to ask you two questions. You were a little earlier on that. You weren't listening to your teacher. Um, show by if, applause if you yourself went to John Muir Middle School. Whoa! All right. By way of applause, if, you, if your child or your grandchild went to John Muir Middle School. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So his leadership has, has, has come upon many of us, and we're blessed to have him. So... This is kind of a warm-up softball question for you, Dr. Miller. <laughs> so how has your role as principal changed over the last few years? So good morning, everybody. Glad to see so many familiar faces. And by the show of applause, I can tell already, you know, you're a great group. You have kids at Muir. You've gone to Muir yourself. Uh, so the role of principal and for all of our educators really has changed a lot in the last few years. So in my role as principal, the responsibilities just have continued to increase. We do uh, more and more for students. Uh, it used to be, you know, the three R's and that was pretty, pretty basic. Now there's so much more that we do related to uh, students' mental health and providing services in that area, uh, physical health. I mean, the pandemic helped to really move a lot of that along. We provide food for every kid on campus. There's just a lot. So the job has grown. But in particular, the thing that I would say um, is just, one, that the kids have more needs and that um, the pandemic was horrible for everybody. It was particularly um, difficult for our young younger kids. And so a lot of our kids, as they came back, uh, one, they have behavioral issues. Uh, more so than before. We have 1,500 kids at Muir. It's, it's a big school. And a lot of imperfect kids that make bad decisions. But in general, we have pretty good kids. We're, it's a good school. We have, you know, in general, the typical Muir kid makes good decisions all day long. Uh, but we have more kids that are challenged with that. That year of being at home, lacking socialization, that really, I think, did a number on some of our kids. Some of them are completely back and good as new and just like they were before the pandemic. But we have a lot of students who are struggling with different behavior issues. And so not only is there more students with those issues, it's also some of those uh, behaviors are more extreme. But the bigger thing even is just um, kids who are having issues with anxiety and depression, but really anxiety. Like I can just tell you as someone who you know, works at a school and sees it every single day. We have so many kids that just um, struggle with dealing with stress. And it, so in some cases, they don't want to come to school. Um, in some cases, it's just they really have trouble. Even, you know, the classroom setting, even the personalization, the socialization is stressful to them, that they have trouble even, like, connecting with other kids. So 
that's been the biggest change um, with the kids. And then the last thing I'll say is this. Uh, during the pandemic, unfortunately, I feel like our country became much more divisive and people just had a lot more issues with one another. And um, I think because of school closing and reopening and mask mandates, somehow, you know, our public schools got caught up in all of that. And so I think uh, a definite challenge has been that there is a group of, it's generally parents that I deal with, that the school has become something of the enemy. Um, and so I get a different kind of like uh, anger or confrontational spirit in some of our parents that I didn't see before the pandemic. Um, all these things I would say are getting a little bit better. Like last year was really tough. This year that just passed was a lot better. And hopefully after a couple of years, we'll get back to where we were. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, segueing, uh, focusing less on children and more on the role of parents and guardians. Yeah. Uh, we have many here. And what do you see as a key issue that you've seen parents and guardians struggling with in helping their children thrive? Okay, so I would say, um, that's a good question. Uh, there's two things. So one is at school when, they're, when children, you know, a lot of times, again, I'm speaking from experience as a middle school person. Uh, when kids struggle, like they often go through elementary school and they get all the best grades and everything's perfect. And then at some point, it's middle school or high school, they get their first B or Bs or C or they get in trouble for the first time. And I think one is, you know, having some grace and understanding for our kids that, you know, their kids and life is hard and is a challenge for all of them. And that, you know, it's just because they got perfect grades all the way through doesn't mean that they always will. And that's okay. Um, I think the other thing is um, knowing where to turn when your child is struggling. And I think our schools more than ever are prepared with counselors to help your child. And I would say definitely in an academic area if they're struggling, but also in if they're struggling with a friend issue, a death in the family, things like that, anything that, you know, their emotional well-being, our schools are prepared for that. We are more and more adapting to meeting those needs for students. Um, I would also say connecting with kids. Sorry, I have a number of things, but Please. connecting with your child. Like I think um, sometimes it's hard for parents to understand as our kids become teenagers, like what's going on and just avoiding those yes and no questions. Like, did you have a good day? That's a short conversation with your kid. That's a <laughs> yes or a no. Um, but I mean, it's asking those questions that like, what was the most interesting thing you learned today? What was the most challenging thing you learned? What did you do at lunch? Who did you do that with at lunch? And asking those questions and really trying to elicit that. Kids are resistant a lot of times, but we have to, as parents, be the ones who are um, pushing that. Um, I'd also say that um, sometimes at the, on the home side, I see a lot of parents struggling when their kids have mental health issues. And I just think that, again, with this anxiety thing, it's hard for some of our parents who haven't ex uh, experienced that or had those things to really accept that it's real or that their child is really having this big of an issue or that it needs to go to some length as far as like seeing a therapist or because that wasn't necessarily our way as we grew up, but that's kind of what they need now. And so we try and demystify that and tell, you know, mental health is, you know, if your kid had a broken arm, you take him to the hospital. Well, if your kid has a mental health issue, it's the same thing. It doesn't display the same way, but we need to address it in the same ways. And then the last two things I would say really quick is uh, social media is horrible. It's like maybe 90% positive, but that 10% that is not is super evil for our kids. And I would just, I try and say this every chance that I get with parents like, there's a time and a place for social media and that's like when you're an adult and you, you know, are mature enough to handle that kind of responsibility and know how to do those things well. For our kids, it's such a horrible place. They are exposed to so many negative things that they wouldn't necessarily be exposed to. It's a place where they can be actually mean and cruel with one another. And I just, I think a lot of parents have trouble saying no because everyone's, you know, everyone's on Instagram and everyone does this and it's that, you know, I don't want to be the only kid, but have your kid be the only kid that's not doing it and they'll be so much healthier and happier. And then the other thing is just technology and screen time. I just, 
uh, I think we also as parents have trouble limiting that. And I mean, if, if nothing else, if nothing else, please take your child's device or devices um, when they go to bed. I mean, you can do things like being on circle. There's a lot of apps that you can use to monitor how much they're on and what they're on. But I would just say like, we have so many kids, so many, like it's not like, oh, there was this one kid. It's like we have dozens and dozens of kids who are super tired throughout the day because they've been up till two in the morning on TikTok or they're online on things that they shouldn't be on late at night or they're on social media at one in the morning saying things that they would never say in person to somebody's face, but they feel brave at you know 1 a.m. to say something or post something inappropriate. And so I would just, I would say those things you just really need to get a hold of for the sake of your child. Wow, a lot there. And um, what I've heard is not so much about academic, athletic, and artistic development and education, but the whole person. And I know you've been intentional in bringing in programs to help support and develop the whole student. One of them was Muir Empowered. Can you tell us uh, just one beautiful thing about Muir Empowered that yeah, I've heard? So Muir Empowered was a, is a day. So it's a complete day. It's not a day of instruction. It's a, like a, a all day conference. We put on a conference for 1,500 kids. We bring in about 28 different speakers, everything from like we fly in empowerment speakers to help kids, because here's the thing. We're trying to teach kids to be self-advocates. We're trying to empower them to do for themselves because that's, you know, the more they can do that, the healthier they will be. So we teach them about mental health things. We talk about, you know, we have to talk about things like suicide prevention. We bring in therapists, not to do therapy, but to demystify therapy, a lot of our kids think, oh, if you go to therapy, there must be something wrong with you. And there's not. We want them to understand, hey, these are simple ways or things that you can do to feel better. They, they go through, uh, we have mindfulness speakers. Every one of them has a session where they're doing yoga. And again, it's just to help them with self-care, to help them take care of their mental health. And it's one thing we do, and it's all day, and we devote it to it because it's that important. And again, I think for a lot of us, I'm 53, like school today is nothing like when we went to school. I mean, we're still learning about things. And yes, the, the 90 something percent of what we do is academics and all these activities, but there is an element of it that has completely changed. Kids are so much different than they were when we were kids, but it's meeting them at their needs. It's meeting them where they need, you know, we, we didn't have to deal so much with mental health years before, but we do now. And, we can either do nothing about it or we can address it and help try help to those kids to be successful. Yeah. Wow. Well, that, that was my last question for Dr. Miller. And um, I know that uh, you wanted a time just to offer uh, some words of encouragement uh, from yeah. a from spiritual standpoint. So you can do that. And then I want to take a moment to pray for Dr. Miller as, as I also pray for all of you. So why don't you have the last word before yeah, I pray? So, here, so I'm a believer. Like, I, you know, we talked about some of these crazy places that I've been in. You know, South Africa, my wife and I were uh, missionaries there, Christian missionaries. We were teachers and we were preaching on the weekends and things. So I just want to empower you to, to pray for the schools, pray for the kids. I mean, honestly, that's like, if you want to impact our society, there's a lot of ways that you can do it. If you want to, you know, create the kingdom of heaven, uh, one of the things that you can do is pray for the schools, because that's where they're getting so much of their formation. Pray for the kids, pray for kindness in their hearts, pray for the adults that work with them. Pray, if you want to pray for Muir, pray that we would be able to bring in highly qualified, caring adults, you know, because we're hiring right now, and it's, it's getting harder and harder to bring good people into the profession. But I would just say like in your daily prayer, like in whatever your discipline is in that, that you bring up the schools, whether it's your child's school, your grandchild's school, the you know, school in the neighborhood, but to just pray for the folks there because we're the ones who are hopefully training up our kids to be, you know, Christian or non-Christian, to be good people in our society and in our world. Yes. Wow, a wonderful and encouraging call here in this uh, house of worship. Uh, greatly appreciate it, Dr. Miller. Uh, if you don't mind just standing, I'm going to rest my hand on your shoulder, and we'll together surround Dr. Miller in prayer as we close this time of uh, God's Word together. All right, will you join me in a word of prayer? O Holy One above us, 
among us and within each one of us, God of heaven and earth. At this moment, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for um, Dr. Miller and his family, uh, the call upon their lives to serve others, how you have called him to be a caretaker, an educator, and a leader for so many young people. And it's not just the young people that you have touched through him, but their families as well. So we applaud you for the mighty work that you've done through Dr. Miller. And we pray your hand of care and guidance and vigor upon him as he continues his great work here in the community and beyond, that you would continue to do your work of servant leadership, of care, of counsel, and empowerment through Dr. Miller, not only on this day and this next semester, but from his life forward. And for all of you in this space, may God be upon you. May you help children thrive for they want to experience God's kingdom. May you uplift them and listen to them. May you guide them and offer wisdom and insight and most importantly, grace and unconditional love. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you very much. And one more round of applause for Dr. Miller. This time, uh, it's the first Sunday of the month and we gather for this meal. It's a meal that Jesus instituted with his first disciples thousands of years ago. And he took two of the most common and, and simple elements of his day, bread, and juice, and wine. He took the bread, gave thanks for it, and he broke it. And he offered it to his followers, saying, this is my body given for you. Each time you take of this meal, remember me and the the sacrifice and the lesson I'm about to show to you. And after the meal, he took a cup of wine, gave thanks to God for the wine, and he offered it to his disciples as well, saying to them, this is My blood, my blood of a new covenant based on the sacrifice that I'm offering to you and all those who are broken and want to be made whole. Each time you take of this cup, remember me and where you might find wholeness in your brokenness. This is a meal not based on what you've achieved, not based on what you've accomplished or merited, but it's a meal of abundant grace. And each time you come of it, it's a statement of faith saying, yes, Just like every human, I'm broken, but in this one whom I'm I'm following, I can find wholeness. I can find God's kingdom. I can thrive. All are invited to take this meal. We're going to have our administrators first take this meal, and our ushers will lead you as to when you might come and take a piece of Christ's body and Christ's blood.
On our stage, you can see these beautiful flowers behind us. Today's flowers are sponsored by Joan Chandler in loving memory of husband, Chris Gargaro, who has passed away May 7th, 2019. Chris celebrated his 80th heavenly birthday yesterday on June 3rd. Thank you, Joan. Chris is dearly missed by many. Now I'd like to invite Carolyn English with a reminder about an exciting production coming up. Thank you, Elisha. Greetings, Burbank First United Methodist Church and all you people online. We are once again bringing back theatrical performances and we welcome and need all of you. If you have any interest in acting, directing, or supporting the arts, I hope you will join us at our first meeting next Sunday after church in Stamper Lounge. Scripts will be available for you to read and take home. Auditions will be at the end of August and the performances will be here, right here in our church October 12th through the 15th. The play is The Holy Cows. So you're wondering, well, what's that about? The Holy Cows is a church softball team that loses every game. The cast includes a messenger from God, a part I know a lot of you want to play. There's a crabby old lady. Let me see, there's some possibilities. You're, you're acting only, acting only. We need a sweet eight-year-old, a 12-year-old who knows baseball, and a clueless coach. Hmm. Come find out where you fit in with the Holy Cows. See you next Sunday after church for an informational meeting. Thank you, go cows. Lastly, I'd like you to mark your calendars. Coming up on July 8th at 5.30 p.m. here, we're gonna be doing a family fun night. There's gonna be movies, there's gonna be games, yard games, there's gonna be board games that's gonna be in the Stamper Lounge. We're gonna be watching the movie in Trevor Lounge. There's gonna be food. It's gonna be a really good time. We're gonna be advertising this to our preschool families as well. It's gonna be a great time to come out in the middle of the summer, enjoy some time, fellowship, build those friendships, and have some good memories together. Lastly, if you came today prepared to worship by continuing to offer your support and to this church through your resources, we thank you so much for that because our ministry here is not possible without you. You can donate to our church through our website, which you can see the donation button at the top right hand corner. You can text Burbank First, that's one word, 273256. You can also check out our app. And on our app, not only can you stay connected with us, you can do a lot of other things as well, including some readings and also see what's going on in our church. If you came today with some monetary giftings that you wanted to leave with us, there are offering plates at the end of, this, uh, end of the foyer, thank you, um, where you can leave those donations. Also, if you are new here, there's a little hello card right beside it. If you fill that out, Pastor or I will get in contact with you just to say, hey, so glad that you checked us out. Would love to pray with you or see how we can be a blessing to you as you are on your faith journey. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and invite up Pastor Sam. He's going to close us out. All right, before the closing prayer, I invite you to all stand. We're not playing favorites here. I just want to tell you the, uh, the rollout of who's coming. Next Sunday, June 11th, we have Judy Hessian of Miller Elementary School. The following Sunday on June 18th, we have Martha Walter of Bret Hart Elementary School. And to close us out on June 25th, we have Brandy Sirikowski, who is Larry Stamper's great-granddaughter of Vista Fundamental Elementary School in Simi Valley, who will join us. So come at any time. Great time to invite a friend as we together... Uh, join this journey in helping children thrive. Let us recite the Lord's Prayer together. Words are on the screen for those of you who don't have it by memory, and then I will send you forth. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, all are invited into Trevor Hall for a time of a continued celebration for VBS. And then um, snacks and the food afterwards. As you go forth today and this week, may you go with the presence 
and the power that God invites you into, into his kingdom. May you go with the grace and unconditional love of Christ Jesus. May you go with the spirit that resides in you and calls you to helping children thrive. Amen.